Welcome back to Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for the last mountain stage of the Tour de France, Lourdes to Outer Cam. This show, as always, is presented by Zwift, another crazy non-stop action stage. This is one of the best Grand Tours I've ever seen. I think the best one we've ever covered, and we haven't even finished yet. 144Ks, three main climbs, 2HC, 1Cat1, one or BISC, 17Ks, 7% after 60Ks of relative flat, which would make brake formation an absolute pain again. Then the colder spandels, 10Ks, 8.3%, very hard climb. There is barely any valley once we get started, by the way, into these mountains. Descent, and then the outer cam, 13.5Ks, 7.9%. Hard finish, not to altitude, warm conditions, but not uh, disgustingly hot like previous uh, stages. But if the Tour de France action here hasn't been enough to you, the Tour de France Fam avec Swift kicks off this Sunday, 24th of July. Benji and I will be on site in Paris before the men's race. And Swift and ourselves are calling on all cycling fans to watch the Fam. We will be doing pods on location with Swift there, courtesy of Swift going to Paris. So make sure you tune into those recaps and the highlight videos on the Lantern Rouge YouTube channel from the 24th to the 31st of July. We had the preview drop on YouTube this morning on Podcast Players yesterday. Make sure you check that out as well. If you want to get up to date, maybe you don't watch a lot of uh, women's cycling, that will get you right up to date. It's just in the style of our normal Grand Tour previews. But break formation, Benji, it's been it's been tough all tour, and no, today was no different. Yeah, it was the entire flat section towards the first climb, basically, and it was in so many different steps this time around. We had large groups getting away and certain Yumbo riders trying to bridge over and so forth. But the first one that got away was Wout van Aert, who started off from the bat, went to get away at Paulus, and then Paulus decided, like, okay, I'm here with Wout van Aert. This ain't gonna work out. So he dipped out back to the peloton. Wout van Aert was solo for a while 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 other bear groups were trying to form behind him. And it really came down to Wout van Aert basically getting caught again by these groups trying to bridge over. And another big group went, and Geshka was not in it, who wanted to get first over the top of the Obis, the first bar of the day, to secure the KOM jersey. Now, Geshka not in it means that Kofferdis starts spacing that group. So that's one situation. And then another group goes, where basically... I think Kofidis riders were there after bridging up, but Geshka didn't make it over. And then Quickstep started pacing, and I'll throw it back to you now. Why is Quickstep pacing in a situation like this, you think? It has to be Fabio Jakobsen OTL to make sure that the break doesn't go. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I think he'll finish in time cut today. We'll have to. It'll. We'll know during the pod. But that must be the only reason. Jonas sidled up to his Danish compatriot Honoré, being like, "What the hell are you guys doing? Come on, knock it off. Let the break with Wow and Tanish Benoit go up the road." So yeah, Yumbo Visma Benji, clear plan as always. You've mentioned it before. Get multiple satellite riders up the road so that they can help on descents or pace later. Because like Wow, if McNulty repeated. Yesterday's performance on Spandell or Bisk, everyone's getting dropped except maybe Sep. So if you want Wout and Tage to help, you need them ahead up the road. So Mikkel Björk, I'm not sure if you mentioned Benji. He's nope. dropped. I'm not, I'm not sure if he made it into the group Hedo, but the man who reduced the group to 15 on the climb yesterday was dropped on the flat today. And uh, Jack Bauer, another incident he was well echoff was clipped by a moto there was a pinch point in the race clipped by moto squeezed between that and the car and then the same thing happened to bauer and the domino effect behind he was very angry both motorbikes the sports and aso one i think got taken out of the break but we get to obisk benji breaks like we know it's just like it's just like yesterday if the break is tight the peloton will not rest. And also all the guys from fifth to wherever on GC, they're having their own battle today, the fight within the fight. And so we have Luchenko bridging, Mas bridging, Pitcock bridging, but that was for stage, I think. Menke's attacking. And Yumbo, I think, were a lot more disciplined today than yesterday, where Benoit, we think, overreacted to the Bardet attack. Yes, yeah, certainly. Benoit was in the breakaway this time around, but they did not respond to those reactions from the peloton. And it's also logical, you know, because while we are on the obisk, 
And we see that Hirschi is now dropping as well. That means that McNulty is the only rider left for UAE. And in that situation, when you're Yumbo Visma, you see, okay, well, we've got two riders in the breakaway. That is Wout Finard Benoit. Well, we have multiple riders in the peloton. Nathan van Hooydong just went off the back while I think uh, one of the other riders took over in the peloton. The tempo there needs to be relatively slow because if they can make the gap larger to the breakaway with Benoit and Wout, that breakaway survives longer. And that breakaway means also that Wout and Benoit survive longer so that they can help further in this stage. So. I think everything was under control for that team at that point in the race. Am I wrong? Yeah, because we know now, okay, McNulty is going to pace Spandell. It's all depending on what McNulty can do. And they have complete control on Orbisk. Ineos not interested. They got Van Baal was in the break. And I don't know. Martinez. Uh, Danny Martinez, who looked better today. So huge break. Too many to go through. Menkes is doing his pace. And then, yeah, Nathan Van Hooydong paces them over Orbisk. The gap has been let out to three minutes 30 to that huge breakaway. Van Aert takes off on, off on the descent from the break. Okay, uh, Samzy, come forward on the descent, Benji. Maybe with Hofstetter, maybe it was with Lavelle, and start pushing really hard. And I know, I know Quintana's a better descender than maybe Godu. I feel like they were chasing Menkes and Mas. That was where. Nairo's like, these guys can't pace quicker than those guys uphill, but Enric Maas and Louis Menkes are going to struggle on this descent to down towards Spandell. I, that must have been the plan. I think so as well. I think that must have been the plan from them, right? Like, because he kind of thought, Gudu's a fine descender, isn't he? I thought Gudu's like a pretty yeah. competent descender. So yeah. I, it must have been that. And Pagacha responded. And it was clear Pagacha was going to look at any opportunity today to take risks on the descent. I would actually say Vingegaard could have just let Van Hoydonk pace behind him and he didn't need to be right on Pagacha's wheel. In fact, I think that was a bit risky. One guy's got a lot more to lose. Anyway, they pegged the gap back to maybe 2.55, three minutes, get to the base of Spandell. We see, sorry, apologies to Ciccone and uh, Molima. Molima had been pacing or Bisk. I'm not sure if we mentioned the KOM for Ciccone. Geshkia would lose that, the chance of that jersey today. Spandell, they try a similar thing at the base, but it's actually Wafanat who just takes over, and only Pino and Martinez can keep up with his tempo. Jungles is gone. Mars is having a bad day. Lutschenko's somewhere in the middle doing pretty well. And yeah, so that means no Chikone, no Geshka KOM, and it was McNulty time again, Benji. Yeah, McNulty started pacing in that group, and you saw the group once again deteriorating, rider by rider dropping off the back. We were already missing loads of Ineos riders again in that group. Thomas was one of the only ones left at that point in the race. And that McNulty tempo was once again good enough to bring the group down to, let's say, seven, eight, nine riders, roughly, is my guess from my memory, at least, on the Spondel climb. And when McNulty went over the front this time around, Unlike what we saw yesterday, McNulty just kept on pacing and reduced his tempo towards the top of the climb, and then eventually Pogaccio went for the sprint at the end. Now, Pogaccio knows he needs to attack early, still had the energy to attack early, and that's what he does once again. Once McNulty goes off the front, it's Pogaccio that directly punches in an attack, and Vingo was directly in his wheel, right? Didn't even get out of the saddle, or...? In the saddle, high draft benefit, sort of 30 kilometers an hour plus. Uh, it looked to me like McNulty, his tempo, we don't have the calculations yet, but his mm -hmm. tempo couldn't have been the same as yesterday. Certainly didn't yeah. pace for as long because yesterday he reduced the group to two guys. Today, Thomas, Mankies, I think, were still there. So, or Mankies was ahead. So, and also we saw Benji, I thought he was going to catch Wow or oh, it's going to be close because of the Archaea descent because they had three minutes to break before Spandell and then he starts pacing, it's 250, 240, but then it kind of stops and wow, holds it at 245 and wow, it's great. Everyone's going to give him all the plaudits, but I'm sorry, but Mignalti, if he's on the same legs as yesterday, is going to eat into that gap fast on yeah. 10K to 8%. He didn't. So, yeah. But there's nothing really more to say other than Pagacha, got to give him credit, cr true to his word, spammed attacks over yeah. and over. It wasn't like yesterday against Jonas. 
Credits though to Sepkas, who when the first attack happened was still crawling back. He was the last remaining survivor to get away. Thomas eventually as well that brought themselves back to that group of Jonas and Pogacar, but then Pogacar went again and Jonas followed once again and Pogacar went again, Jonas followed once again. And this was basically for the entirety of Spandel. I think five attacks from what I could count. I think four on the Spandel one in that earlier descent. That's five. what I remember, but it's not even like... It wasn't even the pure start-stop attacks. I swear it was attacks where Pogacar makes a move. He rides a, a threshold for a bit and then ups it once again for a bit. Like like those subtle attacks that Nibali did back in the day. Like, I'm doing the comparison to my favorite rider. Do I know, not compare but... these two to that, <laughs> that guy. Who did he beat? JC Perot? <laughs> part -time, Come on, get out of here. Part-time insurance salesman. <laughs> two of friends. Nah, I'm being facetious. But also, never compare them again. Um, I agree, though. He was. These were different. All the previous stages, attack, Jonas in the wheel, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, stop. Here, he's like, okay, I have to crack this guy. And maybe you, you don't know. Remember last year, Benji, Jonas on Mont Ventoux, he attacked Pogacar for two minutes before he dropped with that surge. It wasn't. He didn't just drop Pogacar off the wheel and then away he goes. And so you have to keep pushing on. That was the difference today. And we even see Thomas. He comes back. Sepp Kuss comes back. Thomas counterattacks. And Pogaccio doesn't respond. Nor really should he. He's got a nice buffer. Were you surprised to see Jonas kind of flick Sepp through to really like chase him quite firmly? Yeah, I was surprised because I... Like, Thomas is on, like, 4 minutes 30, whatever, before this stage. It's from my memory, at least. 5 minutes, perhaps. Like... That's far. That's pretty damn far. And Pogacar is the first person in danger there. So I was not expecting Gus to be riled up to do that. But it does show that Jonas was still confident in, in himself. Because let's say that he feels that he's not the strongest. I doubt he'd make that move to Pogacar and say, come on, man, take over here. We got to chase this man back ASAP. But it also felt like he wasn't the one closing it. Because then another Pogacar move went. And I swear Pogacar flew past him like a rocket with Vingegaard yep. in his wheel. Like Thomas was just standing still on the climb. And then I'll, Thomas I like crawled the move back from as Thomas, well. Though. I agree. I Mike, agree. Great move. Maybe Yumbo, maybe Jonas doesn't tell Seb to pace. Maybe he's just trying to ride a steady pace. He's been doing it all Tour de France. Absolutely the, the right move from Grant Thomas. I think he's ridden a really good and smart Tour de France, actually. And yep. yeah, we get into the Spandel, the top of the, the climb. Pagacha, a big attack, but this one, he what in my mind, he wasn't trying to gap Vingegaard here. He's just accelerating to make sure he's first over. And this is a technical, narrow, sketchy descent. Thank God it wasn't wet today. And he is pushing this descent. And we saw yesterday, Jonas, I think, is the better technical descender. And again, Pagacha nearly won the tour today. He was extremely close to winning to, yeah. to, uh, the Tour de France today, and that is why you always must try, and that's why you have to respect him for it, trying on all possible terrains, even when it doesn't suit him versus Jonas on this descent. He made Jonas make a mistake, and it nearly cost him the Tour, heart and mouth stuff. Vingegaard didn't take a bad line. He pedaled too early, clipped it. He nearly did that in another moment, this mm -hmm. Tour de France, and just held it up. And Pogacar kicks out of that and starts, yeah, going really hard. And Vingegaard eventually comes back. But that was, like, this is what we don't really look back, Benji. Like, you can't make a mistake across three weeks. Yeah, agreed. You can't make a mistake like that. And when we're talking about mistakes that happen, we see one a few corners further by Pogacar himself. He takes a corner, again, very wide, like yesterday, when we saw in the the descends yesterday, Pogacar does once again here where he takes the corner and has to go really wide. And he doesn't instantly give a problem to Pogacar, but Vingegaard passes him. And then it looks like Pogacar has an issue that he brings him into the side. Like, was it panic or? A little, oh, it's not panic. It's a bit much to call it that. But he, he held it up. He was fine. Well, and then it was when. Not on the road. Well, no, he held it. He was on the side. Oh, yeah, yeah. He didn't go down. Yeah. It was all good. And then he was, he tried to pedal really hard. He put a big pedal stroke down on a very loose gravel at an angle, and he tipped it over. Not yeah. a huge crash, but even at 25 k's an hour, 
I think it might have been less than that. You, you go down on gravel and he's ripped up his shorts. And yeah. it really, it seemed to be a huge blow for the confidence. Vingegaard has Wout van Aert ahead in the break with Martinez and Pino. Martinez actually did a pretty good descent. I think he's one of those guys who prefers descending on his own compared to following wheels. His descent looked better than Pino to me. He's got Wout ahead, Jonas, and he waits for Pogaccia. Um, So honorable thing to do. And I guess I think he thought I can drop him on how to cam anyway. Did you so, have? Um, <laughs> you know I'm a terrible person. Listen, I know, that's why I'm if asking. someone can explain to me why can Pogaccia attack the mistake after Jonas made a mistake, but Jonas can't. Now, the reason he shouldn't have done anything was because it didn't make any sense. He's got half the descent left. He's mm-hmm. 58 kilos. He's um, probably feels superior anyway, and he's got teammates, Tej Benoit and Sepp Kuz coming back from behind. So there really is no point. What would you have done? I think in that situation, like, uh, I probably would have thought about my reputation in the moment, and therefore I likely would have waited in that sense because I wouldn't want the backlash in that sense. But you're right, tactically it made sense. Tactically, it made sense for Jonas Vingegaard to not keep going in this ascent because sure. the note bringing back Gus from the group behind, also bringing back Thomas in the, yep. in the, in the same moment. But it, it's kind of irrelevant, is it? Like for, for Jumbo, whether Thomas is back or not, like who cares? Oh yeah, you just want, you, you just want numbers around Vingegaard. So it's a moot point. Like I don't believe that there should be a rule that if the yellow jersey crashes on a descent, you don't have to wait, but vice versa. Uh, it's up to Jonas, but it, tactically it's a moot point because he probably should have waited anyway, and he did, and it played yeah. off because Wout van Aert sits on the break. They get onto the mythical Alcam climb, 37 sort of minutes, 38 minutes break, might do it in 40, and he's sitting on Pino and Martinez. Pino goes hard at the base, starts at aggressively pushing and blows himself up. Wout and Martinez go clear. They're exchanging turns. We realize if Wout van Aert goes over the top first, and Pino's not second, thanks to Menji's maths, apparently <laughs> he could have won poker, which I did not know. Um, didn't know that was possible. Back in the GC group, the note leads in. Oh, no, sorry, one thing we, before then. After the Pogaccia lay down, mm-hmm. he's on the radio for like five minutes. Yep. And I'm thinking, oh, oh he's, he's flattered. That makes sense. Vingar's not pushing the descent. But he goes back to the car and doesn't change bike. He's not even adjusting his shifters or anything or banging his shifters back into place. He just took a beat on from the car, had some words with them, and then continued. So I think, I think they were telling him to keep attacking the descent. Yeah, I think so as well. And there's actually one sentence in, here, in there that I heard when I switched to commentary to ambient sounds instead. And that was that he said, I just want to win the stage in one of the sentences. I don't know the context of the stuff around there, but that would suggest that the car might have been telling him on that dangerous descent of like, oh, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, stuff like that, you know? Yeah, well, I think they'd be like, you made Jonas make a mistake already, which he did. So keep going if you're okay. But he was like, I just want the stage. Uh, But that would prove difficult. Pardon? He wants to survive on these fuck these tires that he mentioned in Slovenia. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not wet, but he certainly wasn't tipping it in as acutely as Vingegaard, but I think that could just be a technique thing as well, not necessarily the tires. But yeah, they get to the the, the GC group gets there, Benoit paces, Sep takes over, he starts doing Sep Coos things, and this the group of, I'm not sure who was in it, I can't remember, maybe, no, Guru and Quintana were behind. Forgive me that I'm not across the top 10 battle as well in the back end of this race, but uh, Menkes gets dropped. And then Luchenko, I think, was hanging on. He eventually gets dropped. Maybe he was ahead. He was with Verona. Then Thomas is dropped, I think, off Kuz pacing. And so we have Kuz yeah. just pacing Jonas and Pogaccio. We're looking at Pogaccio. The jersey gets corded, unzipped, and then... But no attack. Kuz obviously had lifted the pace to drop Thomas. There's Wout van Aert ahead. And they use Wout van Aert as a satellite rider, basically, because they know that the GC group's going to catch them and they don't want to go to a sprint. And van Aert does, does just yeah, a cr- crazy pool, Benji, and a crazy team masterclass. 
Yeah, 100%. Wout wins this stage if Jumbo Visma don't try and win this stage with Jonas Vingegaard, for example. But that's irrelevant. They are trying to win it with Jonas Vingegaard. We indeed see that Pogacar is having different things happen when it comes to a jersey and so forth. You told me in the chat to me that I, I think Pogacar is looking weaker right now. I think he's looking weaker. And you're right. Like There's a notable like suffer state for Pogacar, right? And the more we see it, the more it becomes clear, right? Yeah, because the thing is, right, like bluffing. I mean, he caught me. I thought he looked weak on Perigood yesterday. He might have if Jonas went longer, but then he was fine in the sprint. I think his powers of recovery, if you give him three minutes off, he can give you a very good sprint at the end. I'll never know if Jonas could have dropped him on Perigood. I think he could have on Pegua, but he didn't. Jonas didn't try, so it is what it is. But yeah, I think I think he... Um, he and he was calling for Ria Bashenko on the climb to spray him with water. And he was just looking. Also, when Kuz lifted, there was a brief helicopter shot. He was just off the wheel a bit. Um, and then, yeah, eventually Wavanaut dropped him off the wheel, off Jonas' wheel. And that was the green light for Vingegaard to just absolutely send it on Altacam. And he puts a big, big gap into Pagacha. He seals, barring accident or incident, this Tour de France, winning by a minute 04 to Pagacha, who I don't think blew up in the same way he did on Granol. I think Pogacar yep. stayed doing his pace a bit more here. And yep, bear in mind, so well. like, he's got half his jersey, uh, his shorts ripped open, and his, like, he's probably in pain. I, this is not the same as Granol, particularly given he was spamming attacks on Spandell. Good performance from Pogacar. Wout van Aert third on 210. Thomas had to change bike, but still finishes fourth on 254. Godou fifth on 258. His slow and steady pace all through this third week paid off today and Lutschenko 6309 same time as Martinez Kuz 327 Vlasov 404 late mover on GC Pino 409 same time as Menkes Quintana 522 uh, Yates 534 uh, that's everyone on GC actually no Bade 640 so GC is now Vingegaard 326 Thomas on 8 minutes third so yeah a big gap. Go to <laughs> fourth, moves into fourth on 11.05. That should be safe. Um, so Go yeah. will finish fourth. Quintana fifth on 13.35, only eight seconds out of Menkes. TT will decide between them, but I think Vlasov Lava? will o- overhaul those of, both of them on 14.10 and move into fifth after the TT. Bardet on 16.11. Luchenko moves into the top 10, ninth on 20.09. And Yates... Yates is somehow going to finish this Tour de France in top 10 on 20 minutes, 17. What a crazy, crazy t- TDF, big, Benji. Big credits to uh, the team of Groupama because I swear they had all their riders, eight riders, Madawas in the descent crazy. of Spondel or something, still in, near that group or two riders ahead or something. Madawas is by far one of the best domestiques in this entire race next to the likes of Van Aert. He's like a also... pocket Van Aert. Yeah, he kind of is. He's very versatile. We said it before. Yeah. He can top 10 every monument if he tries. Like, this is a rider that can do that. And he's doing that solely for Godou this race. And he's a brutally strong domestique. And also credits to Godou because I I would have never expected him to top five his ground trail. I'll say that honestly. Like, did not expect that at all. I expected one very bad day like he usually has. He did not have that so far. Oh, I Let's did. Hope he, he got doesn't lucky. Lose ten- yeah, he, he, got he got lucky on Granon. Granon as well. Yeah. He was being brought back by Van Aert when Van Aert went Van back Aert. to get Roglic. <laughs> yeah. And then on Pagua, he got brought back because they all waited and decided not to attack each other. He had a bad day there. He so he got lucky, but, but... it's fourth in the Tour de France. Like can't take yeah. it away from him. And he, I think he rode these two stages very smart for a punchy guy. He let all the other guys burn themselves and yeah, he even took some time, I think, on the ramp yesterday. He's a little bit fresher compared to the other guys. If he'd done the jersey up, he'd be even further ahead. Menkes, I think you can't criticize anything he's done. To be sitting sixth on GC, I know he's 1340 back, but sixth on GC for Menkes going into the TT, even if Vlasov overhauls him, crazy performance. So, yeah, but the main headline, Benji, oh, sorry, uh, Jonas Vingegaard also, with winning the stage, goes into the KUM jerseys, so... They have green and poker, I think, wrapped up as well, mathematically. Yep. Yellow, of course, you never know. Teams will probably be Ineos, depending on the break tomorrow. Pagachi Youth, 
or white jersey. But yeah, Jonas with a 326 lead, Benji ahead of Pogacar. That's um, that's not the, that's more than the Roglic Planche de Belfi gap. That's yeah. that has to be insurmountable. It's gonna be a tough one to uh to come across that. But I know you want me to double down double hardcore down. on my Triple initial Pogacar pick. I I In can't do tomorrow. that. Objectively, I can't do that. Objectively, I would say that this Tour de France is sealed as long as Vingegaard stays on his bike. But um, yeah. I, I just can't sit in the camp of Pogacar on 325, mate. Like, I know you want it, but I'm not that I'm not that insane. <laughs> you got to triple down on him. Pjerg didn't OTL today, I don't think. He'll be back tomorrow. Pogacar gets in the break. All hell breaks loose. Um, you're, you're doubling down on him. Are we switching yeah. around? <laughs> nah, I always thought this would happen. <laughs> this tour wasn't even close. Like, really. And it hasn't been since the first rest day because Pogacar was only 40 seconds ahead. And if, you know, it could have been less than that. This tour really wasn't that close. I mean, for, I'm probably jinxing it for Jonas. But yeah, tomorrow's stage, 189K stage. It is the prototypical ruler, classic sprinty guy uh, stage finishing in Kao. It's just they do not want to fight long for the break tomorrow. There's a series of rolling hills from 65 to 90 Ks. There's a couple of like 2K 5%ers, the last ones, 50, uh, 1,700 meters, 5.5%. 5 .5%. The finish is slightly uphill. And oh, I, I think Alperson should pace tomorrow, Benji. And, oh, of course. And Bike Exchange. Or should yeah. Bike Exchange trust Matthews in the break? No, nah, I think that they're going to pace tomorrow. I expect them to pace tomorrow. The climbs are 2.2 kilometers at 1.7 kilometers at 5%. Like, sorry, but if the sprinters teams can't control this one, then then it's a pretty sad situation. Is the they climbs that neck them, is the climbs that like ruined them in previous breakaway stages. I think on this stage, without the breakaway, without the hills in there, the bigger hills, the bigger climbs where they can, where they need to give time to the breakaway to make sure their sprinters don't drop. I think even Quickstep might give it a try with Jakobsen. Like we saw, is this too hard for Jakobsen? We saw last year that he beat Demar on an uphill, well, a bit of an uphill sprint in some shape or form in, in the Vuelta, right? Or is that not the same? I don't have the exact gradient of the finish. I know it goes to like, it looks, it looks a bit severe. I need to see the exact gradient of the finish. But yeah, that, are you talking about that Portugal one for Jakobsen against Absolutely Merlier? No There's that Portugal one against Merlier. He cooked him. It was slightly draggy when Remco was doing the lead outs. It might have been Valenciana. Apologies if I've mixed them up. But he, I'm in Vuelta for Fabio Jakobsen, where Jakobsen did it uh, to Demar on I like an uphill ramp good. in the last kilometer. So I'm looking at the Algarve one. The first one to Portimao had a little hill. It was the third one to Faro had a little little drag too. And so I think I think we're both right quoting different different races. I think Jakobsen might be not too bad on this if it's a soft stage. I mean yeah. he, and uh word on the street is that we have I haven't verified, but everyone is inside the time limit no. today. So that's good for all the sprinters. We saw Gronovic and try and get an early break, <laughs> hoping to make it easier. Um, so yeah, I'm going with Wout van Aert, Benji. I would like to see Yumbo give Laporte a chance in a break, actually. Um, if, if a strong ruler break goes, I'd like Laporte to get his chance in that. I think Wout van Aert wins, but Philipson and Jakobsen will be extremely motivated to win this. And Groenewegen. I think so as well. And when it comes to the green jersey situation, it's not that close that Yumbo wants a breakaway to go. For example, it's completely sealed, as we said, like a week ago. So there's no incentive like that to make a break go. I, If it goes to a sprint, it's definitely going to be out that goes in it. When it comes to the break, I I don't think they'll try at Yumbo. Will they, you think? Will they try with Laporte? Just in case a, a break can't be controlled. But still, is that even worth spending your lead out on that is one of the stronger lead outs in this race depends on the size of it if it's three guys absolutely not if it's if we're looking at last year remember this is the stage the yep. transition stage where Movistar backed out three guys when it was like 30 <laughs> guys and it was like Pedersen Sturven types um 
If it's that size, I think you should probably let Laporte have a crack. That's a name that I've we haven't said. He's still here. He's got Sturvin, Mads Pedersen, uphill drags. I do think yeah. I think he goes too early. And if he's got a Philipson or Jakobsen in the wheel, they'll cook him. I think Philipson is the likely candidate to win tomorrow. That's how I see it. Because I think Philipson is one of the strongest sprinters in this race. But his positioning has been off in the first week. He won yep. that sprint uh, the other day, I think, in week two. I think he's going to do it again and make it... Uh, a two for him, and that's going to be uh, interesting because would that make him the best sprinter in this race if Jakobsen can't win, for example, on Champs, if it stays 2-1? I think Philipson with a Ricard lead-out would have, like, the narrative would be very, very different this Tour de France about Philipson. He's legit fast. He's obviously risks threat of death, no problem in the inside if he wants to. But yeah, yeah I'll be interested to see tomorrow. I guess I'm still kind of reeling from the stage. Were you expecting Vingegaard to take a minute 04 and do you think how much do you think the I think two things like one thing could have happened if Bagachi doesn't crash and he's just one percent better and Wout doesn't drop him off the wheel I think it's possible we get a sprint because Vingegaard wouldn't have attacked Pagacha like we didn't see the other days and Pegacha might have won this stage. I think that was actually not far away from happening. I think so as well. And I think the stage might actually be very important for the mental side of things when it comes to Vingegaard. For example, let's say they go to the line and Pogacha beats Vingegaard on the line. He might not think himself, okay, am I really the strongest climber in the world? Because I dropped this guy on Grand all once, but not ever since. And he's beat me on every finish here. He, I, I haven't been able to drop him, but... I felt, when it comes to Alduez, when it comes to Piguera, I felt a low-key insecurity when it comes to Fingergaard not trying to at least put some pressure or a small attempt to drop Pogacar there. So I think today changed that for him. I think he will be more secure when it comes to that in the future. Do you think? Uh, maybe. I mean, he didn't attack him before he was dropped. So, but I, yeah, I mean, when you have the team, they can do it for you. I think it's crazy that it's looking like Yumbo Visma will take home yellow, green, and polka dots. Raul wrote a brilliant article before the Tour de France on LanternRouge.com about how the polka dots has been changed, the competition, the anti pagacha system. And I think the competition, I'm not criticizing Simon Geschke. He tried his best. Maybe Kofidis made a little mistake today, overextending, but he tried his best. I think the KOM has been underwhelming. Like I never expected then I, I thought there would be some front runners coming through and obvious after the Alps. Obviously Geshka was there, but I thought a Pino or someone like remember Woods Pools last year, I thought someone would come through and they didn't, and it kind of it just went to G C again, which I I know it's supposed to be the best climb in the race, but it's actually not. It's whoever gets the most points. I, I don't really like that. It's not Jonas' fault. It's not even the race design's fault. They tried to make yeah. it anti-GC. Just that's the way it is happened. It, is it because the race situation made it that the initial breakaway formation phases were so long that it was so difficult for these QM riders to 100%. actually get in the breakaways necessary? Because I think that's the reason that it went to GC and not the QM rider, because the inconsistency of these riders to get in the break on the Alp stages and the Pyrenees stages, I think, what necked them, what ruined the chances for them winning the uh, winning the KOM jersey. That's at least how I see it. 100%. When you look at Col de Grenoble stage and the last two Pyrenean stages, it's exactly what Benji said. The starts are pretty much pancake flat, and that flogs the legs of the climbers trying to get in the break, particularly like a Michael Woods really struggles to get in the break on the flat. Um, some guys just do it better than others. Paulus, his legs were shot, just trying to get in the break for trying to get in the break for an hour and a half, and you have like Wout van Aert bringing you back, or then pacing, and you're also trying to then get on top of the Col d'Albisc first. Like Geshka paid the price today, and I think that's the key is having little. I mean, and also the the stages went to GC, so that's it's just the way it played out. Um, but yeah, maybe a little roller at the start just lets the break go, and then it's a bit easier and. Yeah, you need tug buddies. You needed always tug buddies. And Quinn Simmons was a great tug buddy this Tour de France. Mollema was good today. Uh, Pierre-Luc Perrichon was good for Geshka, but just wasn't enough. So, yeah, Jonas takes KOM, sort of. 
unintentionally, I think. Um, yeah, and I think Art, so as well. Oh, Van Aert's only seven. Yeah, he he were, would a Van Aert would have been able to actually take it indeed during the stage if it all went differently. But it doesn't matter for Yambo, I think, who takes the polka dot jersey because they each have their jersey anyway. I want to bring one more thing to. Enric Mas, who was in the breakaway, eventually lost two minutes in the single descent of the Obiska and so forth. He came out after the stage saying that since the fall of the Dauphiné, I have an internal fear that I've been suffering with throughout the Tour de France 2022 that I find difficult to overcome. I'm still blocked. I have fallen three times this year, Tirena, Vizulia and Dauphiné. And I hope it changes by uh, La Vuelta. But like, I don't blame Mas for having a fear after crashing. That's 100% the thing that happens. That's normal to have. But... I think, I can you blame, has Movistar done enough to get him out of this? That's the question I ask. I have mean, they gotten to specialists and psychologists? If he had a specialist, he'd yeah, at least not be... Yeah, but there's two weeks, three weeks between Dauphiné and the Tour. Yeah, but he had two crashes before. He'd, he's been riding on the hoods for like the entire oh, year. I know, I know. We've been saying it. Like You're right. I agree. Um, but if he's not told them it's an issue until... A week before the tour, I find it hard to criticize the team. It's clear. Nah. Uh, I mean, I think you're overestimating how quickly you can fix something like this. This is something you fix in the off season with a plan. You're fixing it in a week or two weeks before the tour is not but something easily. Not done. a week, two weeks. I like. I see it as in in March they should already have seen that the descending is an issue. Oh yeah, when he crashed on Carpegna descent, following someone, that was a technique issue. He was on the hoods hit something, bang, gone, slid out. Or maybe it was the best country to send. I agree um, that they should have stepped in maybe. Maybe they did. Maybe we don't know. Maybe Gorka Izagira has been working with him on it. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely an issue where it's it's gotten to the point now where he's not just, like, a bad descender, like we saw in the Vuelta when Primoz went for the no-risk, no-glory attack and he's sitting on Lopez. Now he's losing two minutes on a... 15 minute descent to the group and you you just cannot contest gc like that the energy he was spending to come back was it cooks you and even cooked menkes because menkes didn't get to the group quick enough over the top of orbisk and then had to do uh, the descent solo that he would have spent a lot there small guy so descending and the energy it takes and the other guys who can save more definitely an underrated thing in cycling um and hopefully mars gets his confidence back and but yeah i mean We'll wait to see when he's just sitting in the drops. Uh, again, we might know that something's yep. changed. But otherwise, transition day tomorrow. Benji and I, uh, will, we're heading to Paris, as we said, on Sunday. I'm going to the TT, which is halfway between here and Paris on the Saturday. And hopefully the internet connection will hold up. I think I've got to go to the Orange, or Orange store in Toulouse to get a SIM. So fingers crossed. But, yeah, it might work. It might not. Um, Benji can do the podcast with, I don't know, who's Belgian? Jan Vertonghen. I think Jan Vertonghen's a big <laughs> cycling fan. You can do it with Jan Vertonghen in Flemish and everyone will be fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, big stage today. I'm exhausted, but TDFF, Avex Swift starts on Sunday, so I'm actually looking forward to a bit of a change to that. Thanks as always for listening, and we'll see you at the recap tomorrow. Ciao.